I was reading in my daily devotional, Wednesday, August the 18th, when a verse jumped out at me. And that's a nice thing to have if you're going to have to speak on Sunday. And I hope something jumps out at you today as we explore this verse on this Friday, October the 12th morning here at Turkey Hill. Uh, consider 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Sec, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but for what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Now Paul is talking about establishing this church in Thessalonica. And the story of it is given back in Acts 17. And it says in there that he spoke three Sabbaths. He spoke in their synagogue on three Sabbaths. And this had provoked several of them to start a church, start a Christian church. And Paul and Silas were asked to leave because they were affecting the people. There was opposition. But the church of Thessalonica had begun and continued. And in 1 Thessalonians, he's writing to that church that had formed in Thessalonica. And Paul is encouraging that church because they're so encouraging. Their church was making the impact on the entire region around them. Let's go back to our text. Notice what Paul is emphasizing here. They heard the word. They accepted the word as not being from them, but from God. Look at the descriptive verbs there. Heard, received, accepted. This is very encouraging. And it's a real shocker. And it gives hope for us people standing up in a pulpit. Yes. They accept it as not as the word of men, but from God. It was not just information from these men who were traveling through their region. It was the word of God. God whispered in their heart, this is true. You can believe this. We're not privy to those words that they used when they preached to them. But, but, Paul's word was accepted and received. Have we had that experience? You don't have to be around me long before I tell you about a sermon that completely changed my life. And that should encourage all you preachers here. We're sitting in the front row, listening to a man preach, and I knew this was life changing. And I look over there, there's several people asleep sitting on the front row. I talked to the preacher about it later. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. It didn't seem that special to him, but it was to a few of us who were there. Now, Paul praises the church at Thessalonica. Look at chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. So you became an example to all believers. You became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. And we have no need to say anything. <laughs> we have no need to say anything to you. You're doing so well. Is that complimentary or not? Do they say that about our churches? Look at 1 Thess 1.3. Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labor of love, 
and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Now again, there's a three-point sermon, Nathan, if you need one. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope. And before that, you're an example to all believers. The word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. In every place, your faith toward God has gone forth. He is really piling on the compliments, isn't he? He didn't say that in Laodicea, did he? Again, they heard Paul and Silas for a short time, maybe only three weeks. But a permanent impact was made on the, some of those Thessalonians. And again, go back to Acts 17 and read 1 through 9, and it gives you a lot more details. But that's not what I'm wanting to emphasize. I'm wanting to emphasize that great things can happen when people hear God through you. When people hear God through you. First Thess, how, how did Paul know it was real? Look at First Thess 2.14. The very next verse. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen just as they did from the Jews. What was his proof there that they were a true church? Persecution. Persecution. They endured suffering, just like Paul. Paul had to leave. They asked him to leave. They accepted it as God's word. Now notice there that last part of that verse. The word of God performs its work in you who believe. The performs present tense. The word of God performs its work in you who believe. Now, Paul didn't have gospel tracts to give out, did he? He didn't have New Testaments to give out. But hearing Paul's word, accepting it as God's word, they formed a church which was very, very encouraging. Now, let's take another look at a radical action that took place on hearing the word. This is different. I want to talk about Naomi. Where would I find out about Naomi? Ruth, yes. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I went to vacation Bible school. <laughs> what comes next? Joshua, and then Judges, and then Ruth. And who can tell me the last verse in Judges? The time of kings, right? There was no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in their own sight. Isn't that an incredible statement? But we're talking about the book of Ruth. And we're talking about Naomi. And let's Listen to what she heard. Ruth 1.6 When she, that is Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. Now that's kind of a gospel, isn't it? What's a literal interpretation of gospel? Good news. This is good news. Here is this widow with two other widows, and they heard that God had visited Judah and had sent food. So she's going home. She's going home. She had gone down to Moab with a husband and two sons. The two sons married, 
And then somehow the husband and the sons died. And here is Naomi, the mother-in-law of these two Moabite girls. And what's she say? She said, stay in Moab. Marry, raise children. Right? Now one was named Orpah, and Oprah said that her mother got mixed up in spelling, and Oprah became, or Orpah became Oprah. But Orpah went back. But not Ruth. Not Ruth. Ruth is determined to go on with Naomi. Listen to the scripture. Ruth 1, 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth did what? Clung to her. She hung on to her. Do you have that relationship with your mother-in-law? I had a good mother-in-law. I mean, I had a good one. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, Naomi, but Ruth clung to her. Don't miss that. If that's, if that's all you got from the message, that's enough. Now, Ruth 1, 16 and 17. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you for where you go, what? I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. My people, your, your people, my people. Your God, what? My God. Where you die, where you die, what? I'll die. And there I will be married. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything, but death parts you and me. Now those verses used to be used a lot in marriage ceremonies. In the 50s, there was even a popular song, Whither thou goest, what? I will go. But beloved, it, what we want to get is the devotion that this Moab daughter-in-law had for this Jewess, Naomi. No, Naomi and Ruth go back to Judah. We don't know how they went or anything like that. But Ruth, but Naomi said, I'm going home. I'm going home. Why? Because she heard the heard word. If you have to put a title to the message, that's it. The heard word. The Lord has visited Judah, giving them food. So Naomi and Ruth go back, and some of Naomi's old friends come out to meet them. And what does the Bible say in Romans 1, or Ruth 1, 20 and 21? She said to them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. Isn't that a victorious testimony? Wouldn't that attract a lot of people? It didn't bother Ruth, did it? And I bet in a very short time, Naomi was so, so sorry that she had said those words of defeat. What did Naomi mean? Pleasant. What did Mara mean? Bitter. Bitter. I went from pleasant to bitter. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Oh, beloved, have you done that? Have you given a bad testimony? Naomi was bitter and spoke against God, but Ruth didn't see it that way, did she? She had seen enough of Naomi that she was going to go with her. 
Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. When you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Is that devotion or not? From one woman to another. We may feel like Naomi felt. And we may say what Naomi said, but God, help us, help us, help us. How many of you were privileged to hear Conrad Merle's series on Ruth? Whew. The greatest series of messages I've ever heard. I think we heard it three times. One time in a chunk of four, one time in six, and one time in eight. I think it was, again, the greatest series of messages I've ever heard. What was the word that Naomi heard? The Lord has visited Judah, giving them food, right? Where did she hear that word? In Moab. That's exactly what it says, huh? In Moab, she heard that God had visited Judah giving them food. Evangelism somehow, right? Evangelism. <clears throat> what was the end result? I'm going home, she says. What was the end result of this heard word? Her step grandson ended up where? In the lineage of Jesus. In the lineage of Jesus. In the lineage of Jesus. There are some shady characters in Matthew 1, isn't there? Who are they? Well, Ruth was a Moabitess, right? Rahab, right? Tamar. And anybody else? Doesn't matter. But they all got in the lineage. Isn't that something? Isn't that encouraging to us? There's hope. There is hope. Let's look at another example of the heard word. This is taken out of uh, Memories of Sandfields. Mona, you've got that over there, I saw. You had it yesterday. Little booklet written by Bethan Lloyd Jones. Who's Bethan? His wife. Now, Mason Van and Rachel had the audacity to name their little girl Bethan, didn't they? Sand Fields was a little area down on the south coast of Wales. There's a man there they called Stratfordshire Bill. He was a 70-year-old drunk. He wasn't an alcoholic. He was a drunkard. And so profane in speech that nobody wanted to be around him. But one night he is sitting by himself in a pub and he heard this. One of the men had gone to church that Sunday night and had said that the preacher said it was never too late for a man to be saved. And what did Stratfordshire Bill say to himself? I'm going to go to that church. Now, if you think there was an unlikely candidate, that would have been him, wouldn't it? He was totally despicable. He had a little fish business. He sold fish. And sometimes he'd get drunk and fall off of his little cart backwards into those smelly fish. But next Sunday night, he was at that church. And he chickened out. And he came back the next Sunday night and what? He chickened out. And he came back the third Sunday night and a man came up and laid his hand on his shoulder. <laughs> and he said this, are you coming in, Bill? Come and sit with me. Come and sit with me. That seems like a small thing, but it was a, maybe a determination of this man's conversion. He comes in. He hears the gospel, and as their custom was, he stayed for the after meeting, 
and raised his hand. He raised his hand indicating that he wanted to be saved and that he wanted to join the church. And he did. What happened to his drinking? Gone. Just like that. His drinking was gone. But he had this other problem. His vile language. Here's how God used that. One day he was looking for a pair of socks. Couldn't find it. And he was cussing violently. And it struck him. God convicted him of the sin that he was breaking God's law. And he saw the, just the magnitude of what he was doing. And God, he cried out for deliverance and he was delivered. Now he's 70 years old. And you have this situation that he lost his hope. And he told us, you know, he told the people at church, how could God save me? How could he love me? And guess what? They reasoned with him from the scripture. And guess what? He was gloriously delivered from that. And he died at the spiritual age of three. The spiritual age of three, he died. It's all there in chapter eight of that book. It was one of the remarkable things that happened when Lloyd-Jones left the medical to become a pastor. And his wife is writing that story. He died in spiritual victory at the age, spiritual age of three and, of course, chronological age of 73. But his conversion was so big that she put it, oh, devoted a whole chapter to it in the book. And it thrills me every time I read that. Do you see how the heard word applies to Stratfordshire Bill? He's in a pub. But two people over here are saying, I went to the church and the preacher said, what did the preacher say? He overheard a conversation that the preacher said, there's hope for everybody. And Stratfordshire Bill said, that's hope for me. I'll go hear that preacher. But there was another heard word in there. Do you see that? He's standing there the third night, getting ready to go home. And what does he feel? A hand on his shoulder. And he said, Bill, are you coming in? Are you coming in? Come and sit with me. What did that cost that man? The church member. Nothing. Nothing. A kind word. A kind word. A kind word. Now, now let me get a little more personal. I was teaching in a community college down in Neosho, Missouri. Where's John Dees? Hey, John's from Neosho, Missouri. And uh, I came home for lunch. My wife came over and sat down on my lap. And she said to me, what does it mean to be born again? I don't remember anything that I said at all to her. And now I can look back and I could see this was conviction of sin. We were involved in some meetings. Uh, I was the volunteer Baptist Student Union director at this little Crowder College. And uh, the churches would invite us to come out and the have the college kids sing some specials or give some testimonies. And Virginia had, and I had attended, and this was about the unprettiest preacher you ever saw. He didn't have any hair, <laughs> went to the same barber I do, and he had missing teeth, and he'd been a drunk. But God moved in on that meeting. McNatt Baptist Church, just south of the Osho, Missouri take it to there, and, and God brought conviction to Virginia's heart and life. And soon, soon, conviction brought this concept of lostness, but soon the meetings were still going on, and she came by grace, through faith, what? 
Not of yourselves, what? Gift of God, not of works, why? Lest any man should boast. Do you know that verse? Do you know two more beautiful verses? And, and for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Huh? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You can't say it any better than that. Virginia came to that, wanted to be baptized in that little clear Ozark stream that ran behind it. Another personal incident, I was riding home on a Sunday night. A teenage boy was with me, and he was telling me that he didn't see much difference between the Methodist church and the Baptist church. I said, well, I've noticed two things. He said, the Baptists preach, you must be born again. Huh? They preach that. They don't teach very well on it, but they preach it. And I said, and also that you can know you're going to heaven. And this young man said incredulously, you know you're going to heaven. And I said, yes, not because of anything I did, but because what Christ did for me on the cross. And so we go on home, and spiritual giant may go in and turn on the TV for Bonanza, right? <laughs> And I hear this little voice from the side that says, you know you're going to heaven? And I gave him the same answer. And I got up and shut off the TV and picked up my Bible and stuck in my Bible, not this one I've got up here. Mac Tomlinson gave me this one. Was this little tract, What Say at the Scriptures? And it's 100% scripture by category. And I just began reading these verses to it. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. God loves you. Somebody was mentioned John 3.16. You're lost. God loves you. He will save you. So... I'm reading those, and sometimes he would say, read that one again. And so I would read it again. I didn't know how to lead anybody to the Lord. I didn't know the Roman road. I didn't know anything. I was a Baptist. I was a director, a volunteer director of the Baptist Student Union. And 20 minutes later, this young man was saying, I see, I see, I see. He was miraculously saved there, kneeling on our living room floor. The, the heard word that got at him was, you know you're going to heaven. Who can give me a verse? How about 1 John 5.13? Anybody know that one? These things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Lord Jesus that you may know that you have eternal life. <laughs> Do you see that? Do you hear that? Do you believe that's written in your Bible? First, he said, I've written these. Now, we, you know, John didn't have chapters or verses numbered or anything like that. These things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Lord Jesus of Jesus Christ, that you might know that you have eternal life. Yeah. I rest my case. <laughs> Let's see if we can reiterate some of our thoughts here this morning. Our text was 1 Thess 2, 13 and 14, and Paul is heaping praise and congratulating the Thessalonian church for the way they had received his word back there in Acts 17. And they had developed a glorious church. It had a clear testimony. And he was very pleased with them. When Jesus sent out the 70 there in Luke 16, Luke 10, I mean, the one who listens to you, what? Listens to me. The one who listens to me the one who rejects you rejects me. 
Does that help in our witnessing? He who listens to you listens to me. The one who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Jesus in this high priestly prayer, John 17, uh, verse 14, I have given them thy word and the world has loved them, has appreciated them, really respects them. No. What do they do? I have given them thy word. I have given the believers thy word. And the world has hated them. Hated them. Are you hated? Am I hated? Would we believe this if Jesus hadn't said it? When we use the Scripture, it can be that God is speaking to that person through us. And that's not, that's not just the pulpit. That's everywhere. How great is that? What an encouragement. I gave three, maybe five examples. Naomi decided to leave Moab and go back to her home on the basis of a heard word that God had given food to Judah. She decided to leave Moab, go home. We get the devotion and the love and the dedication that Ruth had for her mother-in-law. It's just beautiful, isn't it? What a thing. And there's also glorious that God tells us Naomi's testimony to her friends back home. I'm glad to put that in there. That's encouraging. We can do that sometimes either willingly or unknowingly. A bad testimony. Ruth didn't hold it against her. She knew Ruth. Ruth knew Naomi, excuse me. Let's see if we can get some applications for us here today. Ruth clung to Naomi. Who or what are you clinging to? Are you clinging to some old traditional church thing? You walk the aisle and you're converted? No. No. Who are you clinging to? This pretty preacher boy on TV or something like that? Ruth clung to Naomi. (laughs) Paul preached there in Acts 17, didn't he? And when he finished up, it says they clave to him. I'm going to say that's clung to Paul. (laughs) Are you a Ruth here today? You need to see someone spiritual, someone walking in the light. You need a mature woman that you could look up to the way Ruth looked up to Naomi. If you're a Naomi here today, you're a mature mature spiritual woman and you'd like to have a Ruth that you could teach her, help her. Are we talking about what the preacher said in church last Sunday night in the coffee shops grocery stores, things like that. Those two men were in that pub down there in Sandfields. They were talking about what the preacher had said Sunday night. That was enough to get Stratfordshire Bill to go. Are you the church member that might put your hand on Bill's shoulder and say, are you coming in, Bill? Sit with me. Come and sit with me. When my wife came and sat down on my lap there, I didn't launch in to an explanation of John 3. As far as I know, I just hugged her, ate my lunch, and went back to work. Later, realized she was under conviction. Conviction.
1 Thess 1, 5, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and what else? Full conviction. Do we see that, beloved? Our youngest daughter, when was converted, was so sensitive. So sensitive to sin. Do you have the scripture to share with someone who wants to be able to say, I know that I am going to heaven? Now, this is not the track I had there 53 years ago. I didn't have this one, but this is a copy of it. Okay. Picked it up at Glenn Ramey's church in West Phoenix. I just happened to stuck it in my Bible wherever I picked it up. But it was there when I needed it. It was there. And I thank God for that. One night after finishing the so-called uh, camp meetings at uh, Rockport Baptist Church in Arnold, Missouri, I was standing out there talking to a pastor from... Uh, over there around Kirksville, and this girl walked out of the church. And it's like she had the whole weight of the world on her. And I'd known her 30 years. And I looked up and I called her name and I said, I love you. Now, I'm not in the habit of saying that to single women. But it worked good in her life. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power, and then separate from power in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, I'll send him unto you. And when he has come, he will convince, reprove, convict the world of what? Yeah. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And what is the big sin there? A sin because what? They don't believe on you. They don't believe on me. Oh my. Full conviction. I think I can prove to you from Spurgeon's autobiography, he said he was under conviction for five years. Spurgeon was under conviction of sin for five years. His dad was a preacher. His grandpa was a preacher. What did it take? What was the word he heard? Look unto me and be ye saved. He's going to this one church across town. Snowstorm comes. He goes into this little church. And he said the preacher was snowed in. He couldn't make it. So this other guy gets up. And in five minutes, he's over with. And he points at Spurgeon. And what's he say to Spurgeon? Young man, you look miserable. Young man, you look... Now that's... A welcoming committee, right, at the church. <laughs> but it's exactly, maybe, his text was, uh, what, uh, Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be you saved all the ends of there. Look unto me, look unto me. And Spurgeon says, I can look, you know. He couldn't find it any other way. But later he says this, he says, one day with the Lord, was worth all those five years of conviction, huh? One day with the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word, its ability to speak to us and through us and to perfect the work in us. We talk a lot about conversion, but we talk about the life afterwards. Oh God, we thank you 
Some of us here, some can tell 20, 30 years walking with God. And we ask you, oh God, that we could see solid, consistent, simply walking with God, seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. May that be the summary of our lives. He sought first the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.